Good evening. Good evening, HPU Chapel, and welcome to worship. Welcome everyone that is joining us online. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope the semester is going okay for you and that you're doing what you need to do to take care of yourselves as well. I hope you're also enjoying the semester in this new worship series that's based on the emotions in the movie Inside Out. Again, we're looking specifically at God's purpose in our emotions and how Jesus guides us to understand our inner lives so that our wills and our lives might better reflect God's. So tonight we're gonna to spend some time in the book of Ephesians, Matthews, and James to help us learn a little bit more about managing anger. And a quick reminder for those traveling on the pilgrimage this fall break to Asheville, we will have an info session um, immediately following the service this week and next week uh, in Hayworth Lounge, right down the hallway. Um, I wanna take just a moment uh, as well to just express some gratitude. Um, I was watching the chapel live stream uh, while I was away last week at the Women in Ministry Conference and it was inspiring to see all of you uh, from our campus ministries to the congregation to our student employees. Um, it takes all of us and it takes all of our prayers to care for and nurture and steward this community. So I just wanna say, Thank you, we're proud of you, um, and proud of how much this community has grown and developed over the years. Um, and as always, know that you are beloved. Know that you belong in this community. Know that we support you. You're becoming who and what God is calling you to be and do. And know that we're here to walk alongside each of you as we each behold God's grace in our lives and on our journey. So let's prepare ourselves for prayer. I'd like to do it a little bit differently tonight, um, but for right now, you can go ahead and relax yourselves into your chairs and start taking some easy breaths. I'm gonna give you some instructions and then we'll take some deep breaths together. So go ahead and take those easy breaths and allow yourselves to slow down from the day. Don't get nervous, but in a moment, I want you to find someone next to you, maybe one or two people that you can pray with. Now this can be a verbal prayer or a prayer that you pray in the silence of your heart. And just a reminder that God knows what we need um, so that you can trust that in terms of the details, um, of the person that you're praying for and the amount of time that we will spend doing this. Um, but just communicate to your partners um, how you're going to pray for one another, verbally or silently. And so I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, and then we'll close out together in prayer. But first, let's take some deep breaths. So we'll take the first deep breath right here, breathing in, breathing out. Again, breathing in. Breathing out. One more time together, breathing in. And breathing out. Go ahead and find those partners and let's begin praying for one another.
So go ahead and bring those voices back into a silent prayer and we'll close out together in prayer. So God, we offer our praise to you. We offer our pain, our groans, our cares to you. And we trust that you will not waste these experiences and that you will work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So now we say thank you in advance as we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, HQ Chapel. Um, I'm going to ask you all to stand and join us tonight in worship. Uh, this evening, I invite you all to have a different approach to how you're going to worship tonight. Um, you may have come in here with a whole lot of stuff going on uh, this week. Test week's been going on these past couple weeks. Uh, we're getting ready for fall break in a couple weeks. Midterms coming up. Uh, and so I invite you just to settle into this space and that this worship time that we're about to have, we're about to sing holy water. Let God's words and this song be like sweet, sweet honey on your lips. How good is that? And let, I encourage you to worship freely, however it looks to you, whether that be raising your hands, a silent prayer, clapping, whatever it looks like to you, I invite you to worship freely and openly as this is a safe space.
Hey everyone, my name is Caroline Marcus. I'm a member of the Board of Stewards and I invite you to pass the peace of Christ. Um, as you stand and worship with us, please just remember that um, God is with us through thick and, thick and thin. Um, and whether or not, like, if you're going through, like, family troubles or friendship troubles or anything, regardless of what's going on, God is always by your side. And that he will always be that right-hand person. Great. 
everybody. Um, my name is Zaria, and I'm the philanthropy chair for Board of Stewards, and I'm here today to give you the word from the board. So first off, we want to invite you all to HPU movie night tomorrow. First, we will have dinner at the CAF at 7 p.m. Then we will head over to the Podell Cinema in Wanick for a movie night to see Inside Out 2. So if you're interested, please scan the QR code up there and um, be on the lookout for an email from Emma for more information. And number two, uh, Board of Stewards applications are still open, but they will be closing soon on September 25th. So please send in your applications if you haven't already. Being a part of the Board of Stewards is a great way to get more involved in the chapel community and in the surrounding High Point community, so definitely check it out. And last thing, uh, Board of Stewards is raising money to give to the Salvation Army's Angel Tree. So through the money raised, we are planning to give toys to kids in need in the High Point area. So this year, we're planning to raise $10,000 for the program. So if you would like to donate to this cause, there are two, um, what are they called? Plates, offering plates, um, where you can donate. And um, also, there is a link on the HPU Chapel Instagram if you want to donate that way. And any contribution or donation is greatly appreciated, and it will go towards helping a child in need. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the service.
Huh? What? What? Oh, you said nice shoes. Uh, my shoes? I forgot the name of them, but Preston told me about them. They're amazing. You'll have to ask him after the service about it. My name is Cody Lambeth. I'm a board of stewards member as well as a breakout group leader, junior. But firstly, I really want to thank Gospel Choir, Genesis Gospel Choir, as well as Collision. That is beautiful that we can all worship and, and hear others worship about Christ. But obviously, I'm up here to pray. So if you guys would join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as, as we've been singing, we need your grace each and every day. Father, remind us about what an amazing God you are, that you would send your own son to come die on the cross for our sins, not that he has sinned, but that we had and that you loved us so much that you couldn't bear being apart from us. So you sent your son to die on the cross for us. And that if we believe in that, that if we have accepted that grace, that we can join you at our home, be reconciled to you. And that we can be ambassadors. We can praise you about that. Each and every day, we can praise you for the God that you are, the love that you've shown us. Lord, I pray that that would be true for all of us. I pray that we would be meditating on that each and every day, that we would be able to see the God that we follow and see how amazing that he is. Lord, I also pray that uh, Preston would be speaking your word, that you would be speaking through him, that we would learn about who you are and how we can follow you better by these words. Father, I pray over this service and that we would all just learn and grow in you. Now, if you guys would join me in saying the prayer that we've been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good evening, my name is Mia Spees and I'll be leading us in scripture reading tonight. We'll be reading from Matthew 5, 21 through 24, Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, and James 1, 19 through 20. So Matthew 5, 21 through 24 says, You have heard that it is said of those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has said something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27 says, so then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of, of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Finally, James 1, 19 through 20 says, you must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Man, can we give God a round of applause through the ministry that's happened through the music here? Man, what a gift. Thank y'all. Thank y'all, thank y'all. Uh, it has been a long month this week. Uh, for many of us, uh, but I'm grateful you are here tonight. You've done the hard work of getting here. I pray that you are here now in presence of God. Reverend Williamson, thank you for starting us that way. I don't know if, how that was for y'all, but for us in the back, that was an incredible way to start chapel, get to know some folks, go deeper into prayer from the get-go, get out of your comfort zones from the beginning and start getting into God's Word. Uh, we're doing this series right now on uh, God's purpose and our emotions, thinking actually that God actually might be speaking more deeply to us. And like, it's some rich scripture tonight. 
Uh, I could hear y'all like thumbing through your Bibles really quickly as Mia was reading through those. Go to breakout groups afterwards. All the scriptures there, you can go deeper into it with other folks uh, downstairs in some of the rooms in the back uh, because this is some beautiful stuff to get into. And there's perhaps nothing more difficult to talk about than our inner lives. That's actually what God wants, the very depths of us. That's what Jesus talks about more than anything, like that our hearts might be one with his. Well, we talked about this last week, that uh, you're made for joy. I don't know if you knew that, but you're made for joy, but so many things get in the way, and we fall for traps that are less than joy all the time, but actually God's great desire is that joy's God might, God's joy might be in you, that your joy might be complete. Uh, this week, we talk about anger. Someone, when I came to the room tonight, said, I'm pumped that you're going to do this because I got a little bit of that going on in my life. I think a lot of us got a lot of that going on in our life. It's kind of always either maybe, sometimes at moments high, but maybe simmering underneath the surface all the time. Uh, so I love the character of Anger from the movie Inside Out. Go see the movie uh, on, Tuesday, on, on Thursday night. Uh, but from, from the first film, this is what Anger looks like. I love this character. Check it out. Okay, no audio, but... Okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell. People. Oh, that's disgust, by the way, this if you're wondering. So here's what's happening. It's not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, back. Airplanes make everything better, including broccoli. Aaron, this is what you have. Where's Aaron? Aaron, did he disappear? Aaron's got a, a newborn baby. This is what he has to look forward to for like the next two to three years. Yeah, so you got to learn the airplane method. This is very critical for all of you. You got to learn the airplane method with the broccoli. Uh, anger, I like, guess, this thing that comes up in our lives. Uh, scripture takes it seriously, as you heard from Jesus. Serious, like, like there's nothing that's more combustible, more that can erode the inner, your inner life more quickly, nothing that can burn it down faster. And anger. I, I want to talk about the power of anger tonight. Say power. power. I want to talk about uh, the, actually the gift of anger. Say gift. Yeah. And I want to talk about being slow to anger. Say slow to anger. Slow. This is what these passages that Mia's read for us offer us. Uh, scripture takes anger like really seriously. Like it's, it's this thing that we seem to can't control or can't get a hold of. And it's like it's something you got to pay attention to. And yeah, this can be the case for this whole series. You could say like, like you've got to do something with anger before anger does something to you. It's always like lurking at the door right there. I love the way uh, that, the, that Proverbs puts it. This is, uh, wasn't read in Scripture earlier, but Proverbs uh, 14 puts it this way. 14, 29 through 30. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. But one who has a hasty temper exalts folly. A tranquil mind gives life to the flesh, but passion makes the bones rot. I mean, catch that image, right? It's saying like anger actually does, it, it corrupts your insides. It distorts your insides. It rots your insides. It hollows you from the inside out. All right, so when I was in college, uh, there was this, cult, this movie that became a cult classic, Liam. It was called 28 Days Later. It's an awful movie. No, it's not awful. It's a right movie. It's a, like, you're probably thinking, like, isn't that about zombies, right? It's not about zombies. I know, Nate, sorry. Uh, th it's not about zombies. So what the movie is about is, um, well, it's about zombies, but it's about more than that. Any, any post-apocalyptic film, literature, it's, it's a warning. It's trying to tell you something deeper. And in this film, right, like the, there's this one moment where these uh, like, uh, um, animal rights activists, they break into this facility where there's uh, different animals being locked up, and they're trying to free them all, and they grab one of the guys that are working there, and they said, what are they infected with? And the guy says, rage. And they let rage out of the cages, and rage goes all over the country of England. And it ended up having like, like, dead folks on the island, people who are the walking dead. And the warning's really clear if you like, pay attention to the film. It's saying, like, this is what anger will do if, if it, you let it infect you, and it infects a population. Rage. It'll, it'll, it'll be like
like the walking dead. It'll rot you from the inside out. This is the power. This is actually the consequence of anger when it gets inside of our lives and we let it take hold and take root and go deep. One of my favorite writers is this guy named Frederick Buechner, and he writes about anger so well. And he says, this is what, anger's powerful, but it's almost kind of intoxicating. Like, like you ever, like, uh, had a grievance against somebody? Um, have you ever had a, uh, Vincent, you ever had a grievance against somebody, and, like, you, like, you couldn't, like, wait to, like, oh, man, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Oh, you just wait. Oh, next time I see them, mm, I'm going to tell them something. Mm. Oh, and you work out the best arguments all in your head. Oh, how you're going to tell them, how you're going to show them what's what. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You're thinking about your roommate right now. You're thinking about that group project right now, aren't you? You know this anger. Here's what Frederick Buechner says about anger. I love how he writes about this. He says, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. Hmm, fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over the grievances long past. To roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. To savor to the last to some morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback being this, that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. And we don't pay attention to it. And it takes root, and it takes hold, and it has control. We're not devouring anybody out there. We're devouring our very self, and we fall into it. It rots us from the inside out. It's tricky how we fall into this all the time, the stewing, the little vengeances we, we hang on to. And so most of the time, the reason we don't see it is it just sort of stays hidden beneath the surface, doesn't it? You know why it stays hidden beneath the surface? Because you're good people. And good people don't get angry. Oh, no, no, I'm not angry. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You're, are you okay? I'm fine. Good people don't get angry. We push it down. And it festers. And it stays there. And it grows deeper, stronger, takes hold of us in some ways. Rots us from the inside out. Even people who think they're good, they're fine, and we're not. Um, I love this uh, political commentator, David Brooks. Um, uh, he's written for the last, like, 30 years on politics. And he had this great article uh, about uh, three weeks ago, if you looked at generations. If it doesn't just rot the inside out. It can rot a people, too. Like, you know, what he's saying? Or, uh, you can think about this. If you ever let, like, the angriest person have voice on a team, that team is done for, right? Like, if you let that angriest person get to say what the team does and who they are, man, you know you're done for. If you let that group project get run by the angriest person, you know you're ruined, right? Like, but like, if Brooks says, like, he follows the generations, and it's really interesting that there's consequences for ages of, of, uh, of, of anger. Like, if you look at there after World War I, just age of anger in World War I, of violence, there was the hedonism of the 20s. People retreated from anger into this hedonistic way, and then after that, there was the Great Depression. There's these consequences. And then after the Deep Depression, more anger got a hold of people and more, and then there's World War II. And it's kind of cyclical. The reason I bring this up is I think that actually we're in a really unique time. For the last, like, 12, the 12 years I've been in ministry here, I would say, like, the, the last, the, the 10, about 10 of them were what Brooks calls the age of anger. Whether it's on the right or the left, it's the age of anger, where anger took root and we just devoured ourselves. And we became skeletons. And here's why I think it's interesting for you right here, right now. Is I think we're exhausted of the anger. I think most people are absolutely exhausted from it. But here's the important part. Is it exhaustion that leads toward a different way? Or is it just that exhaustion just stays under the surface? Just waits a little longer, waits for it grows a little bigger, grows a little more inside of our hearts, so that, I don't know, a decade from now, another decade, just another age of anger. You know, we gotta have better eyes than that. We gotta have better hearts than that. And this is where Jesus takes us. 
This passage seems like a fiery one that Jesus says tonight. Let's go to Matthew 5. Let's go back into it, Gabby. This is uh, so powerful. What Jesus does here, he'll say often like, uh, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. Say, say, I have say unto you. That was bad leadership on my part. I say unto you. That's much better. People like what he's getting criticized for is people think that he's ignoring the law. He's not ignoring the law. He's going to its root. He's breaking down fundamentalism and getting to, not to the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. In this passage on Matthew 5, you could spend your whole life in Matthew 5. It's where the Beatitudes are. Blessed are those, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Oh my God, it's amazing. And then he gets to these passages. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And he starts out with, 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 um, with murder, and he says, no, it's not about the murder. It's not about the behavior. It's about the anger in the heart. And, and then he goes on, and he says, it, it, it's not about adultery or predatory behavior uh, and sexual acts. It's about the lust that takes over people's hearts. Christianity is not about behavior modification. Jesus wants to get to your heart. And what's in your heart? Because what's in your heart is what will come out of your life. And he's asking you, what, what, what's in there? Like if you had taken a good look, are, are you willing to go in there with me? I'm there already, friends. I'm living there, he says. Are you, are you going to come with me? Take a look. What's in your heart, he says. He invites us in there. Take a deeper look. Get inside our own hearts. Investigate what's going on in the hidden places of our lives. So it doesn't rot us from the inside out and doesn't rot the world from the outside. He's saying, no, get in there. Nothing is hidden from God. Take a deeper look in there with me. And so if he's going to do this, he takes us there. He takes us to the hidden places of our lives. He takes us to the places that we don't want to go to. I think actually when we do that, we can realize, this is the second part here, that anger actually has a bit of a gift to it. Say gift. I came into the office this morning, and uh, students were already here, and they were already preaching the sermon. They were arguing about anger. It was wonderful. It was great. Y'all are amazing. Uh, and they were like, and one student said, uh, no, uh, anger is a gift. And the other student's like, that's crazy. Anger's not a gift. And, and she said, have you ever loved somebody really well? And he's like, oh. If you're not tracking yet, here's what I mean. The more you love, the deeper you love, Liam the more you are tempted toward a deep kind of anger. And maybe it can be a good kind of anger. Have you ever loved something so much you were afraid harm would come to it? Anger is the motion of that which you would protect because you love it so much. Whew. There's a beauty there to it, isn't there? Like there's a kind of righteous anger there when you see innocent hurt, when you see people degraded. Like, no, there's a righteous indignation that can fire up in our hearts. I've said it a thousand times to this ministry, but I love it. It's my favorite quote by St. Augustine. One of my favorite quotes by St. Augustine. He says, hope, say hope. hope. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Anger for the way the world is and courage. That it doesn't stay that way. Anger for the way the world is and courage. That it won't stay that way. But you can see the order. The anger is secondary to the courage, not courage secondary to the anger. It's got to be put in its place. Anger. Make sure my microphone's working here. Anger. There's a good kind of anger. Here's the reason. Uh, this may be um, over, over some heads. Some of y'all are going to get this tonight. I, I, I've said this in the work that I've done before. Um, some of the work I've done is on em, and emotions and write, trying to write about it. But I think of it this way. We'll talk about it next week as well. For me, anger is the shadow side of love. Say shadow side. shadow side. If you ever love something great, you know there's some anger that might come with it to protect that thing. But if you ever investigate your anger, ooh, then if you ever think about your anger, what you're angry about, you might actually just discover what you love. You might actually think about, oh my God, that's actually what I love. But here's the question. Is it worthy of your love? The anger that you have, is it a worthy love? Anger is the shadow side of love. You pay attention to it. Jesus takes you into the heart of your very self, says, come with me here. Come take a look. Is this anger that you've got under the surface, it, like, is it worthy of the love that you, I've given you? Maybe it is, but it, there's some beauty to it. Anger is the shadow side of love. 
Anger will tell you what you love. This is why we come back to Ephesians. Let's go back. We've spent so much of the beginning of the semester in Ephesians. I want to come back to it so we can spend a little bit more time in Ephesians. I don't want to just stay in the book of the Bible and run away. I want you all to write this on the tablet of your heart. I want you the, I want the wisdom of the Bible that we spend time in to get inside you, to get inside your heart. Ephesians says this. So then, putting away falsehood. Oh, man, that's already good, isn't it? Putting away falsehood. Putting away falsehood, let us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Uh, I heard a, uh, someone tell me this one time, I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. I uh, said, uh, my wife and I have made a rule. Uh, we will not go to bed angry, and so we haven't slept in 13 years. You'll get it later. It's funny. Don't, go, don't let the sun go down in your anger. But be angry, but do not sin. If Jesus gets to the heart of the matter and says, pay attention to your anger, Paul's way more practical here. He's like, yeah, be angry. There's some goodness in your anger, but do not sin. Pay attention to your anger, but do not sin. Here's, the, here's why this is interesting to me. He, he's saying, like, there's something about your anger that you're not going to be able to control. There's going to be things that happen in your life, and it's all of a sudden, like, you can't just, like, snap out of the anger you're human it's going to happen to you there's going to be some agitation there's going to be some anger but also there might be some good anger too things that you can be angry about like if we're not angry about children going to bed uh hungry i don't know like what else we would be angry about like that's why i love the board of stewards work and the stuff that they do in the community it's like they're paying attention to kids and how they can get a leg up and get a start there's some anger that can motivate actually some just work in this world undo some injustice that we see in the world the reason this passage is so powerful for me it says be angry but do not sin and do not give room for the devil which means you got to pay attention to the anger maybe it can motivate you in some ways but it can't have the last say this is real uh one of my best friends years ago uh someone who i look up immensely he's like one of those holy people i know uh, they had put their son in daycare, and when they picked up their son from daycare, they recognized bruises on their child. And they asked the people who they worked for, like, or the people where his son was, like, what happened? They said, oh, he fell. And they just didn't feel good about this. They took him to a doctor and said, those look like marks that a human put on him. And so they didn't know what to do. Like, they, they, they told authorities about it, but there was, like, not much they could do. There wasn't really clear evidence. And so they took their son out of, this, out, of this, uh, out of this daycare. And one day he's at work. He's a teacher. And he walks in the door, and there's the person. And he said, Preston, I, I don't know what happened. My hand started to shake. And I didn't know what to do. And he said, what I did is I went and, go, I went and talked to my... Um, uh, my, my supervisor, and I said, I, I, um, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but there's a person here, and here's what I experienced. And they had this relationship with the supervisor. I said, uh, we got it. And he said, I got to go home. And he and I were talking about, I was like, are you, like were you worried like, you couldn't like, teach that day? Like, what was that? And he goes, Preston, I was worried I was going to do something that I couldn't imagine. Like, that's what he's talking about. Like, there's depths of you that you haven't discovered yet. There's fragile parts of you that you haven't even seen yet. There's wounds that will happen to you and maybe have that, like, we are just more fragile than we could imagine. And the response that we might do would be things that we'd go, that's not who I am. Guess what? It is who we are. We are people who harm has been done to us, and we can do great harm in return. Got to pay attention to the anger that creeps up in your life. I pray to be as holy as that kind of guy, to recognize my own limitations in my own life. We should be too, so that there isn't a foothold for the most evil things that can happen in this world, especially in our own hearts. Because we expect more from ourselves if we're following this one, to be the people we're called to be. Ephesians, be angry. Don't sin. You're human, but don't let it take over you. Let it have a word. Never the last one. There's a gift to it. it. Motivates you to protect that which you love. But it never has the final word. So if it's a gift, there's always something. It can go wrong. This is the thing. Like, 
how does something like a gift go wrong? Uh, sin. Exactly. Uh, you're like, thanks, Preston. Uh, real helpful. Here's what I mean by like sin makes things go wrong. Most of us are educated. This is what I'm, we're gonna. This is we're not in youth group here. We're gonna uh, to the next step. I want y'all to understand the Christian tradition. It's best. Sin is not doing bad things. It's not lying. It's not cheating. Like that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Sin is distance from God. Sin is like your heart is far from the heart of God. Like, your heart uh, can't be shaped by God's very heart, which Jesus is inviting you into. Uh, another way of putting it is this way. And another Augustine quote for you. Sin is disordered love. Say disordered love. Disordered love. Disordered love. What does that mean? It means actually you've got some loves in your life, but they're all mixed up. They're not in the right place. And why is this important? Pay attention to the, the train of thought here. If anger is the shadow side of love and sin is disordered love, what happens when anger gets involved in disordered love? It'll rot you from the inside out. When we love the wrong things and we're disordered loves and we put our loves and trust in the wrong things, it's a cocktail, it's a recipe for anger over and over and over again in our lives. Here's an example. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's good to have a, a, a good reputation. Oh, come on. You all believe it's good to have a good reputation. It's good to have a good reputation because you're good people. Good people have good reputations, right? Can I get an amen? amen. I get, then you get the compliment. Man, you're awesome. I know. That's great. Thank you. I am. I am awesome. I am a good person. You get the reputation. And then what's the next thing? Like, maybe someone forgets your name. Maybe you don't get credit for something you did. Maybe you don't get the grade you deserve because you, you think you deserved it, right? Like, the slight, like, that's a cut at my reputation. But I got to keep a good reputation. And so you get invested in protecting your reputation. You spend your energy, energy protecting your reputation. You forget that it was about being good in the first place, but it becomes more about looking good in front of people protecting the image that you want to cultivate. And so what grows is not goodness, but it's like agitation. That people don't see you the same way that you see yourself, or you think that way that they think of you that way. Do you see? It's a recipe for anger, for irritation, constantly in the middle of our life. And Jesus says, you've got to find a different way. Because the recipe is there for you again and again. This is why it's so important at this time of your life. This is huge. This time of your life. It's about impressing the right people. It's about can I get in that office? Can I get that grade? Can I get that person's attention? The recipe that could be where we fall for the wrong thing again and again sets up a recipe for disaster where we don't go out to be the person of deep conviction and heart. We become the kind of people who protect a kind of image that others can see, and therefore we miss the point and have a recipe for anger at the deepest parts of our lives. Can you see it? So important at this time of your life. Jesus invites you into the deeper matters, into your heart. What actually you really love. What are you really cultivating there? I got a, a, a thought for you. This is, say, slow to anger. This is the end of the message. We'll give you three things towards slow to anger, and then we'll get out of here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, slow to anger. This is what the Bible's taken us. If, if, go back, if we go from Ephesians, uh, then this passage from James, uh, the, the board was looking at on Monday, absolutely love. You must understand this, my beloved. You must. Don't you love that word, must? It's that eagerness. You, you must understand this urgency to it. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Slow to anger. There's a path for actually being slow to anger. And the first is this. Say honesty. honesty. That Ephesians passage, 425 says, put away falsehood. I love that part. It's, a, it's like inviting you into an honest conversation with yourself. Honesty. God's already at the depths of your heart. God's already there. God's saying, why don't you get on in here and take a look? 
what's going on in your heart. Be honest. Uh, quick story. I was in the library today. I hide in the library on Wednesday so I can write my sermons. And I'm walking out of the library, and uh, the alarm goes off. Has this ever happened to you? It's terrifying. I'm a good person. I don't, I don't, I don't, Cameron, I don't take things from the library. Uh, but I'm walking out, and then I realize, oh, yeah, I got an overdue library book in my book bag. And so I come back in, and I see Lenita Williams. If you've never met Nita, like, best person on campus, she goes, ooh, Preston. And I went, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. And I said, I bet this doesn't happen very often. And she goes, it happens a lot. <laughs> and she said, my favorite story, she said, um, there, was this, there was this young woman the other day. Uh, the alarm went off, and she went out. And she's like, oh, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 she, she pulls out her Bible and goes, would it be my Bible? Like, it wouldn't be my, my Bible. And like, and she's like, no, there must be something else. And Lena, she's so slow to anger. She's lovely. She's like, I, I'm sorry, but may I take a look in your bag? And the young woman's like, no. <laughs> she's like, I'm sorry, I really need to take a look in your bag. And she said, okay. And she took a look in her bag, and there were three theology books. <laughs> and she said, I'm not a student here. I'm visiting somebody, and I was going to read these. And I, I promised I was going to bring them back. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you were. She's like, you can read those over here in the library, but you can't take them out. I love this of her. One, she's modeling slow to anger. She's modeling something actually God. Slow to anger with you. Slow to anger with me. But even more, she's like, we got to look in the bag. We actually got to be honest with ourselves. We got to go inside the dark, hidden places we don't want to talk about. God doesn't want just pieces of you. Doesn't want the shining reputations of you. God wants the depths of you and wants you to see the depths there too. Be honest. God already sees it anyway. Honesty. And then if you will, say heart to heart. If you're going to be honest with yourself about what's going on in your heart, have a heart to heart with your anger. <laughs> like, well, have a heart to heart with your anger. Have, like, what are, what's that anger that's under the surface and what is it about? Is it worthy of your loves, this anger? Is it a kind of anger that actually seeks to make the world more just, more beautiful, and that can be put next be below a courage and a love? Have a heart to heart with it. Am I loving the wrong things? Do I think I deserve things? It makes for a recipe of anger. Is it righteous anger or is it distorted anger? Maybe it's some of both. But you've got to have a heart-to-heart -heart with it. And last, I would ask this. If you have honesty, you have a heart-to-heart -heart with your anger, anger, you actually let God have God's hands on it. Say hands. I actually have God put God's hands on it. Uh, it was about, um, I don't know, eight, nine years ago here. Um, uh, I was really angry. Uh, and I was saying, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine. And a really good friend um, pulled me aside one day and said, you're, you're really angry. And I said, um, maybe. And he sat me down and pulled things out of me that I hadn't seen yet. Things like where I thought I deserved certain things. Things where I thought I was actually better than the way I was being treated. And I was able to see that there was this anger that was boiling in the depths of me. And I said, well, what do you do when you've got this going on? And he said, um, it's silly. You don't want to know. I was like, no, I really do. He says, I don't, well, when I've been in a place similar to you, I actually imagine myself with my quaking hands sitting at a table. And I hold my hands out. And then I, I, I see Jesus sit across that table with holes in his hands, he holds mine. And in that moment, I really understand what patience means. What I understand is not God being slow. God is not slow. That's not what patience is. God is steadfast suffering and love for me. That's patience. My anger just seems so little there. It seems like my anger put holes in those hands. And the anger of everyone around me put holes in those hands. And it just means less. Or it finds its right 
place. That those wounded hands that are holding my quaking ones, those steadfast loving hands are the ones that are wounded for my transformation. That I might be slow to anger. That I might be more like him. I invite you to be honest with what's going on inside you. I invite you to have a heart to heart with that which is all that is inside you. And I ask you, man, if nothing else, let God put God's beautiful wounded hands on your hurt, on your anger. God might transform it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are yours, the outside and the inside. So take our hearts that they may not be far from you, but they might be quite near to you. You might take our hearts and transform them. That we might have some anger, some sadness for what breaks your heart in the world. To let it have a word, but never the final one. To move us out in loving kindness in the world, steadfastness in the world. Something that looks more like your grace. And all God's people said, amen. this song kind of reflect on how faithful God has been in your life and how even in your sin and when you're at the lowest parts of your life God can see, continue to pursue you um, and how he's always there for you and he's never going to forsake you. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful in all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as my friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your
your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Um, may you recognize the gift that anger can be to protect that which you love, which God loves. May you recognize its power and put it in its proper place. But may you go on that path of letting God actually put God's hands on it so that it finds its place in your life, a word, but never the final word. My right, friends, may you take your hands and let God do something with the hold your hands, but at this song, may you lift out your hands and sing with one another. So go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God will raise. 